stop. Okay, I'm going. So, um, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to this next lecture in this uh, series of uh, international certificate course. My name is uh, Raghavendra Jana, and I'm at uh, Skoltek in Moscow, Russia. I'll be speaking a little bit about um, the basics of remote sensing, uh, introducing you to a few terminology and uh, also some uh, applications in the agriculture and the environmental sciences fields. Okay, so I was initially planning on making this a little interactive, so I had some questions like, uh, I'm going to ask you, like, uh, what is remote sensing? and see what you guys say, but it uh, looks like we now have to, I'll have to give the answer to, the, to my own questions. So, uh, remote sensing is basically the process of acquiring or gathering information about an object without actually being in contact with it. So, the key point here is without being in contact with it, right? So, uh, there are many different kinds of sensors that we can use for remote sensing, but something that is very common and uh, which I think every one of you has used, it is a camera, right? So you're not really in contact with the object that you're taking a picture of, but you're gathering information about it, okay? So um, remote sensing, the most common application of remote sensing is for Earth observation. So there has been some mention about Earth observation by the previous speaker, by Alessandro Volker yesterday. Uh, so just briefly, what is Earth observation? It is the gathering of information about maybe the physical aspects, the chemical or the biological aspects of our planet by, and this can be both remote sensing or by in situ or in other words, being in contact with the object that we are measuring. Okay, so for remote sensing, there's a lot of uh, applications, such as let's say defense and intelligence. So you have um, defense application, military spying satellites, and other natural resources management, agriculture, forestry, environment and monitoring. Uh, some of these applications may overlap between each other uh, and we'll mainly be talking about applications in agriculture, in forestry and environmental monitoring. Uh, there's also research being done on global warming uh, and also it's very useful in uh, disaster response such as uh, the, you know, monitoring or uh, having resources sent to locations where you have floods or landslides or earthquakes or forest fires or any of those. Uh, law enforcement, uh, geosciences for uh, hydrology, mapping, and uh, development and construction, and also economy. So there were some uh, instances earlier when uh, people in the investment field, financial investment, they would look at Earth observation images uh, from satellites, and they would see how many cranes are being used in a particular region to see what the economic activity is of that country. Right. So these are some of the applications. Right. So brief history of uh, remote sensing for Earth observation uh, in particular. The first aerial photograph or a photograph from the sky was taken in 1858 by this guy called uh, Nedar, he's a French guy. So the airplane was invented in 1903. So in 1858, there were no airplanes to do uh, aerial photography. So what did he use? He used a hot air balloon, right? So this was a postcard that was uh, made in his honor in honor of uh, his taking the first aerial picture and there were a lot of news articles where said that he had elevated the art of photography. 
Unfortunately, the first photograph that he took in 1858 was lost in a fire. And the oldest aerial photograph that we have available uh, is this one, which is a photograph uh, taken in, 19, uh, in 1860 of uh, Boston, the city in uh, the US. This was taken by James Wallace Black. So uh, since then, apart from hot air balloons, there have been uh, there were uh, you know, attempts to use other flying objects as a platform for aerial photography, such as kites or even homing pigeons, which would come back to their uh, homes when left from uh, any other location. So types of remote sensing, usually when we say remote sensing, the first thing that comes to mind is satellites or space-borne remote sensing, but there's also airborne remote sensing and to a smaller extent, ground-based remote sensing. So when I say ground-based remote sensing, how can we do that? So there are some instruments such as this one, which measures the level of the amount of water in the soil so this tube has a sensor inside which measures the neutrons which are emitted from the ground. So it is not in contact with the soil, but it still measures some properties of the soil. Right? Uh, they could be mounted on trucks. Uh, and this particular one is a ground penetrating radar. It measures, uh, it can identify or map the soil properties or the rock properties underground. It tells you where there are cracks, where what the um, structure underground is without having to dig up the whole place. Right. There are also something called uh, flux towers where we measure the uh, amount of evaporation or transpiration from the ground or from the plants and trees. There are scintillometers where we measure radiation from the earth and of course the weather stations that we have uh, all across the world. So we measure radiation, we measure wind speed, we measure wind direction, we measure temperature, rainfall, and uh, many other uh, properties. Apart from that, we, as I said, there is airborne remote sensing where you have uh, sensors installed on uh, under an airplane and that's flown over your uh, area that you want to collect information from. Or it could be uh, on a helicopter, uh, large drones such as these used by NASA, they are similar to the military uh, spying drones or uh, one of those. And you also have the new smaller drones that are uh, or more personal use drones. And then there is the uh, big chunk of remote sensing, which is from satellites. So there are satellites for multiple uh, properties. Some of them, uh, such as this particular one, is called SMAP. It is from NASA in the US. It measures the soil moisture uh, in the ground. The, this one is called SMOS from uh, the European Space Agency, and it measures uh, soil moisture and uh, the ocean salinity levels. There are imaging uh, satellite sensors such as uh, this is Landsat or Sentinel which uh, is again from the European Space Agency. Uh, Russia had a satellite called uh, Resource P um, and recently there was a hyperspectral satellite which was sent up by ISRO in India which is called uh, HISAS. So I just said hyperspectral and there's something called multispectral. We will come to those terms in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, you just know that there are some of these terms. And uh, the latest uh, big thing is going small. Right? So there are CubeSats or microsats which are being sent up in the hundreds mm -hmm. by commercial uh, companies which also have a few sensors on them instead of you know, huge satellites. So a few, this picture is from a few years ago about uh, the state of Earth observation satellites in orbit around the Earth. 
the situation has changed quite a bit since then. But uh, you know, this gives you an idea about the major players, which are basically the U.S., China, Russia, India, Japan, South Korea, and uh, much of Europe. If you want more in, uh, information about the current situation of uh, remote sensing satellites, you could go to the uh, this website here, where they have a pretty comprehensive list of satellites and what they are used for, which country, and what its properties are, what its paths are, and uh, all that information. So, uh, as I said, we have some terminology which you may or may not be familiar with. So. If you're already familiar with them, this is just a crash course uh, refreshing them for you if you're not. So here goes some introduction. Right. So there are different types of remote sensors. Uh, we can broadly split them into imaging sensors and not non-imaging sensors. The imaging sensors might be optical, which is something like a camera. You could have thermal imaging or radar imaging. The non-imaging sensors are uh, spectroradiometers or radiometers and uh, range finders or uh, altimeters. Right. So uh, in microwave remote sensing, we have two main kinds, which is passive and active. So passive microwave sensing is based on sensing the heat or the radiation emitted uh, naturally. So basically, the sun's rays hit the Earth and some of it is reflected back, which is uh, sensed by the satellite or the uh, airborne sensors. So this has uh, also some radiation is given out naturally by the Earth. Um, this is a low energy radiation. And so the resolution, another term, which we'll discuss uh, in a few minutes, is very coarse. right? So you get one value for a big area. Okay. Active microwave sensing, on the other hand, is based on sending out a signal from the satellite itself and getting or sensing the reflected signal back. Uh, this can be very much higher resolution because it's a much higher energy level. You're not dependent only on the solar radiation. The next thing is retrieval algorithms. I think uh, Ivan also spoke a little bit about it uh, earlier today, if you were able to catch some of it. Uh, so basically, the sensors do not directly measure what we want. Let's say the water content in the soil, or the health of the vegetation, or how much precipitation uh, is occurring, or what the salinity in the um, sea is, seawater is. So the algorithms to convert the reflectance or the brightness or the radiation amount of radiation being sensed into these properties, which are the uh, parameters of interest, is called a retrieval algorithm. Uh, there, and it's important to account for sources of variation and contamination in them, such as uh, the atmosphere. So, because if you're sensing the soil, let's say, and the atmosphere also has in some form uh, humidity, so you'll have to correct for that. And uh, the radiation gets refracted apart from getting reflected. Right? So, you'll have to account for or compute what this refraction is or what the Contamination is because of the atmospheric layers and subtract that out from your signal. Uh, for example, this, uh, this signal, if you can see the top part is basically the raw signal and the bottom part is where it has been corrected for the atmosphere. So then you can clearly see that the vegetation or the dirt road or uh, the white panel, they are behaving very differently from each other. And correcting for the atmosphere also gives us better clarity about uh, what we are observing. So the top part in this image is again a non-corrected uh, 
image and the bottom one has been corrected for the atmospheric interference. Surface roughness or how rough the so or the topography of the ground uh, also determines how much of the signal is reflected back to the sensor. So it will have to account for that. So for example, if you have a smooth surface, this might be the signal and as the roughness increases, the signature of the reflectance in particular wavelengths of the uh, radiation are different. So we'll have to account for those. Uh, similarly, you'll have to account for chemical properties of the uh, uh, object you are observing, or the temperature, or uh, any of dozens of different um, factors that could influence or corrupt your signal. So uh, remember, I said earlier uh, that we have something called resolution. So, and within resolution, there are three components: the spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and spectral re resolution. Let's talk about each one of them uh, in turn. Spatial resolution is basically the measure of the smallest object that can be seen by the sensor. Okay, so if you're Sensor's resolution is 10 meters, and if you have an object that is 2 meters wide, uh, it cannot be detected by the sensor. But if the object is 20 meters wide, then it is detected. Okay. So the, it's also re represented as the linear dimension on the ground, uh, which is captured by each pixel. So this is an example. So this is, I think, at about 100 meters. And we definitely cannot, we don't know what we are seeing here, right? We just have a bunch of uh, different colored or different shades, more like a quilt. And then this is at uh, about 50 meters. And we see that okay. and there are some different things around at about 10 meters. Some things are starting to get here. And one meter resolution, you see that this is uh, some area. This is actually um, a university in the US. And you can see uh, there are different buildings here. There are parks. There is a fountain. There's a pond here. And you can make out a bunch of different um, features. Okay. So this is spatial resolution. So temporal resolution, temporal, so it deals with time, and it is a measure of the repeat cycle or the frequency with which a sensor or a satellite uh, on which the sensor is mounted comes back to the same part or to the same location on the surface. Right. So this uh, is influenced by two things, sensor design and orbit design. So in sensor design, you have the spatial resolution of the sensor. If you have a coarse resolution sensor, you can cover more area uh, in a shorter time. So you, your revisit times would be quicker. Uh, similarly, scan width is how much of the ground you're covering in one snapshot. Spatial resolution is for each pixel, and scan width is for the entire sensor. So if you have more scan width, as in more pixels that can take in a bigger chunk of the earth, then you can cover more area faster. Similarly, orbit design is basically the orbital path where on the earth, the uh, satellite is orbiting at what height, at what speed, orbit speed, and uh, please influence the temporal resolution. Spectral resolution is what wavelengths or the number and width of spectral bands in that the sensor can identify. So let's say this is your normal visible light spectrum. So if a satellite or the sensor had just four bands, the spectral resolution of just four bands, then this is how it would see these colors. But if it is 10 bands, then you will have much better resolution of the colors. Right? So this is as simple as that. So um, similarly, 
I said earlier that we have multispectral sensors such as Landsat or uh, Sentinel, hyperspectral satellite uh, sensors, and now there's even talk of ultraspectral satellites. Right? So they're just um, terms that we use to uh, denote how many bands the or the spectral resolution of these sensors. So a multispectral uh, sensor usually has from four to eight bands or uh, sometimes uh, about 13 bands hyperspectral uh, sensors have hundreds of bands so there are sensors which have uh, 256 bands and the uh, ultraspectral uh, sensors which are very rare have about thousands of bands so a uh, pan chromatic image is basically an image that has been um, created by using the uh, responses of from all the bands from the whole uh, sensor and then you have this multispectral image which is uh, each band separately when you put them both together you can get a much sharper image so the band chromatic gives much finer resolution the multispectral gives uh, more uh, chromatic uh, differences and you can put them both together to get a pan, what is called a pan sharpened image. So the uh, spatial and temporal resolution can uh, uh, dictate how these satellites or these sensors are being used, right? For uh, aerial photography. So this on the X axis is the spatial resolution on the Y axis is the temporal resolution in years. And so if you want to do precision agriculture, let's say, or uh, emergency response, so you want that to be higher spatial resolution and also maybe uh, uh, closer uh, in repeating. So maybe you want it to come back every day or uh, every couple of days to see what the situation is. If you're doing climate change or uh, you know, large scale experiments, then kilometers resolution or tens of kilometers resolution and uh, a revisit time and maybe a much higher, maybe in the months is also fine. Right? So it depends on how uh, you want to apply or what your applications are. So let's talk about some uh, example applications. Uh, we talked about land use change uh, It's one of the uh, applications earlier on when I talked about applications of remote sensing. sensing right? So this is uh, Saudi Arabia and the circle around here is in the northern part of Saudi Arabia close to the Jordan border. Um, in 1987, this is how it looked. Right? So there are uh, some mountains to the north and uh, northwest where it snows uh, for a few days in the winter. And uh, as it warms up, the snow melts and uh, flows down to this uh, small lake here. So you can see this uh, path of the uh, these streams. Right? But you can see very little else that's growing here. This is a desert. Okay. So um, in 1991, so this was in 1987, and in 1991, the landscape had changed a bit. Each one of these green dots that you see is a farm. It's an agricultural farm. And each one of those dots is about one kilometer in diameter. So there was agriculture that is starting to be um, performed around these parts. Where did they get the water from? Not from the snow melt, but from drilling a bore hole more than a kilometer underground to get the water. Okay, so they were pumping out water from more than a kilometer underground. It's an ancient aquifers, uh, thousands of years old, with no hope of recharge, and they're pumping out okay, for agriculture. Um, and then about nine more years later, this was the situation, many more farms 
uh, moral all around the place. And in 2012, you could hardly call this a desert, right? So this is more an agriculture area than a desert now. And all of this is being done with uh, groundwater being pumped out. So this kind of change can be detected, right? So in 25 years, we went from being a desert to being an agricultural landscape. So this is land use change. We can monitor such changes happening um, almost in real time. Okay, so this is another application, which is soil moisture observation, how much water or moisture is in the soil, because that is a major driver of uh, agriculture. This is the water that's available to the plants. It is also a major driver of evaporation, which leads to rainfall later on. It's a driver of how much groundwater recharge occurs, how much water reaches the streams. So it's important to measure the soil moisture. Right? So this is more on uh, almost a monthly scale. And you can almost see how the uh, earth is breathing or when the soil moisture goes up and down depending on the seasons. So this is more on a daily scale um, for about a month. Uh, if you have the time, we can just let it run. You can see the, so the scale here goes from zero or pretty close to zero, which is the dark shades. This is the Sahara Desert. This is the Middle East, more desert. Australia, big desert. Uh, parts of uh, the US where it's a desert. So all these deserts, you can see that they don't change much. But other places, you can see that you know, there, is, there are changes. It's sometimes green. It is sometimes yellow. So it, the soil moisture changes every day. Maybe there was a rainfall. Maybe there was something. And we also see these gaps. right? So that means that the satellite did not go over that region that day. This particular satellite, the Answer E uh, sensor on the Aqua satellite has a revisit time of about two days. Right. So uh, classification of crops, I think uh, Ivan also spoke a little bit about the algorithms that go into uh, some of these things in the artificial intelligence uh, side of things. So what we do is we have something like this picture, which was taken by a satellite, and we would like to know what is grown in each of these fields uh, that are there and sort of classify them like this, where each color represents a different type, type of crop being grown there. So this is something that uh, our team here at Spartec is uh, involved in, where we use, try to use multispectral images. So how do we do it? Why do we do this? To uh, estimate food or other crop production for the current year, to know how much we can expect uh, of a particular crop, is there going to be a shortage of wheat or maybe corn or rice or something like that? Um, how much uh, for crop insurance purposes and to prepare statistics for planning for the government. Okay. So the theory is that basically, as you saw earlier with the uh, radiation, different objects reflect light or radiation differently. Uh, this is the uh, wavelength of radiation, and this is the percent of reflectance. You can see that uh, water has very low reflectance to the higher wavelengths, while uh, green grass or dry grass or soil have much higher. So this way we can sort of differentiate different um, land cover, and then we see what type of crop and in what stage. So different crops at different stages in their growth uh, cycle behave differently. So they reflect the uh, incident radiation in a different manner. Okay, so we try to isolate the, these signals and identify what type of crops are being grown in each field. Um, so this is just an example for that. Um, this is what a model predicts, what the ground truth is, and how correct we are. Uh, green is we are correct 100%, and red is we are not identifying the correct uh, crop in those pixels. So this is uh, 
at a pixel level. And uh, we also use different kinds of algorithms to do this classification. Um, they have different um, accuracies also based on how much of each image contains those uh, crops. We can also identify uh, if a crop is healthy or not, depending on you know, different kinds of diseases have different patterns on the leaves, let's say, or maybe even on the fruits or uh, on the seeds. So similar theory where we can identify these um, diseases depending on what kind of reflectance pattern of the signature is shown up. So some other examples are um, um, this yellow patch here is rapeseed flowers in uh, Kursk. Russia. So we know that these plants are ready for harvest while the other plant areas are not. Right. So, so the market can now be ready to say that, okay, we have these uh, this much area of rapeseed ready for harvest. So in the next few days, we can expect X quantity in the market. Uh, air pollution. Uh, Air pollution in a lot of many cities has been a big issue, although now with the coronavirus thing uh, and people staying at home, uh, things have significantly improved. Um, so in India, Delhi or New Delhi, the capital um, has a notoriously bad uh, air quality, but then nobody talks about Kanpur. See, this whole plume of smog or smog is uh, pollution. And Kanpur is right in the middle of it, but nobody talks about it. Well, Delhi is just on the edges. And so we can uh, identify such kinds of situations. Um, turbulent weather. Um, these were at the same time in September 2019, there were four main storms that were raging across the world. And there were a couple more that were getting ready to form. So knowing this, uh, we can have the government agencies prepare the people for such uh, weather. Right? So this is all uh, disaster management, disaster planning, um, early warning systems, that kind of thing. Uh, monsoon floods in uh, Southeast Asia uh, last year. There was a lot of flooding in uh, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Burma, uh, one in the Western Ghat regions in India. So this can be easily uh, identified and modeled for uh, future uh, modeling also. Uh, similar to how Australian forest fires were a big issue. Before that, there were forest fires in the Amazon and also in um, Siberian portion of Russia. So you can see these smoke plumes going out from all the forest fires here, there is clouds and also there is smoke. Uh, another image of the same uh, situation. And this is just an animation from all the information that was gained. The brown or the reddish uh, plumes are smoke. You can see how suddenly it goes up uh, around uh, late July and spreads across the world. So that is the smoke from the forest fires in Siberia. So this is another um, striking example of land cover change or water resources management, natural resources management. This is a lake in the southern part of India, southeast India, and it is one of the and it is the main uh, source of drinking water or the domestic water supply for a metropolitan city called Chennai, right? So this was the situation in May 2018. And in June 2019, this entire reservoir was completely dry. The whole area was dry. There was no water for more than a month. They had no water supply, right? So this was a result of a combination of uh, high temperatures, low rainfall, and uh, overuse by um, humans. 
So these are just a few examples of applications of uh, remote sensing for agriculture or environmental science. So let's just talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we encountered. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them. Obviously, it's uh, the remote sensing for earth observation or environmental science uh, in itself is a complete uh, course by itself. Okay, so we'll just talk about a couple of them. So some of them are, uh, let's say, cloud cover. So if you're doing, trying to observe what's on the ground surface and there's a lot of clouds, then these sensors may or may not be able to penetrate those clouds. Some wavelengths are able to penetrate them, some are not. So depending on the type of sensor, you may have a problem with cloud cover. Instrument reliability, once we send it up uh, into orbit, we, may, we generally do not have much control over how the instrument or uh, the sensor behaves. An example is um, this map satellite that I showed you earlier, which um, was delayed. The launch was delayed to improve the sensor. And after a few months delay, the satellite was launched. The, uh, and then within a few months, the uh, power supply to one of the sensors broke down which is completely um, unplanned for, and there was no way that it could be um, revived. So the sensor was fine, but the power supply went crazy. Right? So this kind of reliability issues you can occur, um, can encounter. Retrieval algorithms, we spoke earlier, they're the algorithms to convert what is measured into what quantity we need it to represent. So there might be a lot of um, as I said, the corrections may not be applied properly. We may not be including or factoring in all the fa uh, uh, influencing processes into the algorithms. So we need to be careful about that. And then the resolution. If you're using the wrong resolution sensor for your application, then uh, your results may not be so good. So uh, we at Skulltech, we are also doing a little bit of um, research into repairing satellite imagery. For example, this is one image from Landsat 7. So what happened was uh, in 2003, I think, one of the, uh, uh, so there's an equipment which is called the scanline corrector, which keeps the sensor on a straight path. It accounts for overlap and everything and that broke down. So now what we get from uh, uh, the instrument failure is something like this. You don't have data in all the pixels. You have gaps in them. Um, there could also be, as I said earlier, clouds or the artifacts which can um, obscure the uh, image of the scene. So we are uh, doing some research into how to recover data from such images, right? So the usual method is to use a time series or multiple images from the same location, but from different times, and do an interpolation between them to fill in the gaps in the corrupted image. But in some regions, let's say uh, this is a table for the city of Moscow, or the Moscow region in Russia. Uh, you can see that there are very few clear days in a month, uh, especially in winter. You can hardly find clear days, right? There are only 82 clear days in the whole year. And the rest of it has at least partial clouds. And sometimes it is so totally cloudy, right? So, and if your satellite has a revisit time of, let's say, 16 days, like uh, the Landsat uh, satellite has, then you have no hope of catching another image which is not corrupt, which does not have cloud cover or something like that. Right? So now we need to rely on methods which use only the corrupt single image or the corrupt image. And uh, we assume that all necessary information is available within the set cell. Right? So we are using some artificial intelligence uh, methods called our deep image prior. Ivan also had spoke about deep prior earlier, uh, which was developed for photo restoration into developing for
for satellites, the satellite imagery. Right? So we try to prepare using these such kind of techniques. So um, I think that's about it right, for uh, what uh, I was planning to talk. And uh, if you have any questions, please let the organizers know about them and they let me know. And uh, I'll try to reply to you as quickly uh, or as easily as much as I can. Thank you very much and have a good day. Stay, stay safe, stay at home if you have such an order from the government. Thank you very much. Interesting you, and Katrina. useful lecture. So, yes, dear colleagues um, and students, um, welcome. You're welcome with your answers, and um, we are open for discussion. Have a good day. Bye bye, and. Everyone. In the evening, you will have one more lecture. Mm -hmm. Thank you.